Brendan, does, um, there's another person in the participants area. Does that person need to be moved up to the attendees? We can know. move her up. We don't have a lot of people. So, okay. as long as you're... <laughs> so that should allow um, Antoinette if you want to use a, a microphone uh, or um, video, you can certainly do that. And there's a chat. You can also um, enter things into the chat. But welcome, everyone. My name is Christina Hendricks, and I uh, am moderating today. And we have Karen Karen Fessenpower. I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I have <laughs> Who uh, is talking to us about open learning and OER in K-12. And uh, Karen has, has got a lot of uh, experience in open education. She's um, run and co-facilitated a few massive open online courses. And here's my son. <laughs> and uh, also the founder of the School of Education at Peer to Peer University, which uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about it all or not, but I will give it away to Karen. Go ahead. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And with me is Verena Roberts, and I'll let her introduce herself. But um, I'm I'm happy to be here tonight, and I'm hoping that this will be more of an open discussion and not much of a presentation. Um, and we'll see what everybody wants to talk about. Farina, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Verena Roberts. I actually do have a, 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 a title now. I'm a teacher with the Palliser School District. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very new. Uh, they pulled me in to help them create OER-based uh, online courses for high school and uh, remix and redesign what they have. Um, they're a brand new school, so they have to recreate everything, I guess you could say. And other than that, I work as the County Learn Chief Innovation Officer and in trying to uh, help with online and blended learning across Canada. And I help Karen. I'm her open sidekick, her open wingman. <laughs> a lot of exciting um conversations in social media this week out of Canada with, uh, I don't know what all has been going on. Is it all BC stuff and the open? Yeah. yeah. Is most of that higher ed focused or? Yeah, I checked. There yeah. was no K-12. Uh, only uh, uh, Funny Monkey, Bill Fitzgerald was there. He's the only K-12 right. person. Okay. Well, it's interesting to see a lot of buzz on the networks about OER and I saw a really interesting conversation today about um, open as a as an enabling um, sort of pathway for student voice and student directed curriculum which I thought was really an interesting I didn't I was I don't know if there was a live stream from that session so I didn't get to see the sort of where that idea came from but I thought that was an interesting that was like pushing the boundaries of, I think, what open can mean. And that's certainly a conversation Verena and I have had a lot of times is what does open mean and how many different things open means to different people. Um, so I don't know. Um, we can either start with questions that anybody has or things that you would like to talk about. Or we could start with just what is open? I'm not hearing anybody <laughs> jump. So if um, Antoinette or others, if you have questions or things you would like to have addressed tonight, um, go ahead and easier, either use your mic or put them in the chat. But otherwise, let's just start with sort of what does open mean? Because I think open can mean so many different things. And it's one of the challenges for me in the work that I do is as open has gotten more and more popular, I would say. And, and I've been, I guess I, I became really aware of open and particularly open educational resources about maybe seven or eight years ago. But I had a very, very specific idea of what it meant and also need for myself. And then over time, my understanding and my interest in it has gotten a lot broader. So my my sort of entree into open was really very specifically 
working with students doing multimedia projects and looking for content that we could use legally. So like doing podcasts and looking for music and being aware of copyright and not wanting to just sort of grab whatever was on the internet. Um, and that's what got me to know about Creative Commons. So somewhere somebody said to me, oh, there's all this great stuff out there that's open licensed, which means you can use it. You don't have to ask permission. Um, so that was like a really specific um, need for open. And that took me into sort of looking more at, specifically at open educational resources, which are things that are licensed in a way that you can reuse them without getting permission. Um, but then I would say, and so, so then I sort of was looking at using things in a mobile environment where I was working with school districts who suddenly had a lot of mobile devices and no money to buy content. So they were looking at alternatives to that. Um, different ways to differentiate instruction, um, alternatives to textbooks, which is a big interest to me. Um, of course, there are open textbooks as well. But then I think since then, I've gotten a, a more of an awareness of what open means beyond just open licensed things. And Verena, you're, you were somebody who really helped me see like what is open beyond just open licensed things. What does open learning mean? So maybe you want to pick up from there. And she was <laughs> the you, Karen, picking up. I, Karen, you know, you are the guru on this. Um, I think what you mean is, so I didn't know about OER or CC licensing till I went to the open conference, and that's what that's what it was all about. It, that was what the focus was, uh, not this year, the past year, but the year before when I was in Vancouver. And I literally went in with this concept of learners um, having choice in their own learning, having a voice in their own learning. What does that mean? Uh, teachers or educators leading them along the path, like you've drawn right here. Um, and and I know the, the key word is personalized, but I've always thought of it as a learning path because the irony is, and actually this debate came up today, was the, the more we learn in the open, the more human, I think, uh, uh, aspect comes out. And I'd love to talk about that a bit more too, Karen, what you think about that. But uh, technology, especially for OER for me, is very um, still technology driven or tool driven in my world. Although I'm learning that that is more expansive than I, like, I know too. But when we get into the open pedagogy and student voice and creation and um, informal, formal learning integration, that's where the teacher just takes on, it's not just a facilitator, it is literally a guide and a mentor and a support network. And really that scaffolding piece from constructivism mixed with the connectivism networks and nodes of learning takes on new meaning. Does that, I hope that right. makes sense. I don't know. That does make sense. And it's interesting because um, Brendan and I were talking before we started the recording about just the whole textbook issue and, and why, sort of why K-12 schools are so textbook driven. And I think some of it is because people are risk adverse and it's like really a safe thing to say we're going to use this textbook that came from some outside place that's been vetted and nobody's going to get in trouble from teaching from the textbook. Um, but I think that most teachers feel like that's not the best curriculum or that's not the best they could do for their kids. And I think, you know, every teacher creates curriculum. And it, it may not be the same as saying like, to sit down and write a textbook, but from my own perspective, I, I don't want more textbooks anyway. I don't think that's an effective, really an effective learning tool. But every teacher remixes content and every teacher creates things, um, although they may not identify themselves as saying like, you know, I create educational resources, all teachers do that. And I think open pedagogy, some of it is about just giving everybody permission to loosen things up a little bit and say there's not just sort of one 
perfect source where all this content is going to come from. I think too, when I look at your pathway there, I think um, how we're being promoted as educators to uh, assess, use backwards design and assess almost at the end as well. And that's an opportunity that I think lends itself to open learning as well, because you have to be open and flexible to learning in different ways. And that's right. part of open pedagogy as well. And you have to have unlimited amounts of content to meet the needs of each individual student. And that's part of OER and open as well. No? I think that's a huge piece, the whole differentiation piece. And that's that was certainly like a middle step for me where I was having working with teachers who really wanted to differentiate. And to do that, I mean, I always say you have to have, you know, 100 different resources. To, if you think about wanting to have each student be able to learn five or six different ways, and then you multiply that by class size, it, it's, I don't know any district that's buying that much content. And so you have to look at different resources. And I mean, in the, with the resources on the internet that are out there right now, I don't, I can't imagine not using all that um, at, for instruction. So I think, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in the chat, um, Brendan says the amount of money that's being spent. And I, I would say that is a huge, huge motivator. If you look at, I think in the U.S. in K-12, the, the number right now is $5 billion on instructional materials, most of which is textbooks. Um, it is. It is a serious amount of money, um, and it's for textbooks that in many places are you know, six, seven years old because of the adoption cycles. I would certainly say in California, um, the, the budget issues there is what's really driven OER adoption in K-12. They, I think, I don't know, four, three or four years ago, they basically said, we have no money to spend on textbooks. and but we have this great OER initiative, and they started reviewing OER textbooks. And, you know, that was, that was a, a real motivator. I would love to see the money that's spent on textbooks be shifted into um, teachers, um, their own professional learning and developing resources. And that was another thing we talked about in the sort of before, the, before we started was, you know, do teachers have time to do this? Are they are they paid to create curriculum? You know, how do you manage all this? And I think some teachers do it on their own time because they really love it or because they really feel like it's the right thing for kids. And I would say I know some teachers who feel like um, from a personal moral standpoint, they don't feel like they want to give kids worksheets every day or textbooks or whatever the supplied curriculum is. And so they're spending their own evenings and weekends and extra time um, doing stuff, but I think you could shift half the money that's spent on textbooks into um, educational staff, and you'd have, you'd have happier teachers and you'd have better instructional resources. I, I think that's a, a good point that we don't want to miss. Um, OERs are not replacements for textbooks. That's, that's one thing, and that's the big thing that a lot of people see. It's, the money you can save there by taking open resources, but um, you know, as we start bringing in technology into the classroom and uh, the adaptive technologies to help uh, adaptive program programs that help kids build their skills and, and whatnot, teachers can start freeing themselves up from being task masters or skill builders and, and start becoming. Uh, project facilitators and mentors for the students. Uh, and so the OERs stop becoming textbooks that become re that, that they read um, because that kind of content is, is really kind of cheap. But they become people who um, uh, build these really cool but fuzzy projects that we can bring to the children and teach each other how to mentor people and mentor our students through that uh, you know rather than giving them the content we're learning how to ask the right questions at the right time uh, present the right problem 
uh, to a student that would uh, engage their curiosity into solving the problems that we want. So uh, I really see uh, open education really transforming uh, education from what we see as the traditional role to uh, a more hands-on student-driven student model. I agree, and I think that, you know, that really is open learning or open pedagogy, which I do think is, is a different thing than just open educational resources. I mean, I think OER has a very, very specific meaning, which is instructional materials of some sort, which could be software, but generally is more content, um, that's licensed in a way that it can be reused, remixed, redistributed without asking permission. Um, I think, so, so you could have OER that's a very traditional textbook. And in fact, some of the, I, I have mixed feelings about it, you know, it, it, because I'm not, I would say I'm not a fan of textbooks, but some of the bigger OER adoptions in K-12 certainly have been very traditional textbooks. Um, I think that the open pedagogy, which is where the where the agency and voice pieces come in, because it really is, it's a different model of learning where instead of having um, a sort of an external content authority handing down the content, it's more of a peer exploration of different learning pathways. Um, I think that that's what's interesting. Um, I've been thinking lately about the the intersections of OER and open pedagogy. And I think there's a couple compelling examples where people have started using OER in a very traditional way. Um, and I, I would say the Utah Open Textbook Project is one of these where they were using printed textbooks and they were pretty conventional textbooks. Um, primarily developed by CK12, which is a great resource if you're looking for sort of pre-developed by experts, vetted um, textbooks for K12 that are open licensed. Um, but what, ha what they found is that as teachers had the ability to begin to think about remixing those textbooks, that they did start to innovate. Um, because they could really think about, you know, what parts of the textbook, and I think to some extent this is something that all good teachers do. You know, we say we're going to teach chapter 7 before chapter 9, or we're going to not use chapter 13. Um, but I think when you have content that you have total freedom to not only make those sort of superficial changes, but also say, I'm going to pull in my own stuff here, or we're going to do something else here, that the they found that the teachers really started um, looking at the curriculum and using it in a different way. So I hope that some of the projects where people are using even more traditional OER, um, that that sort of starts people down the path of a more open pedagogical approach. But I think everybody's not there. And I don't, at least here in the States, I think it's going to be a while. I mean, it's pretty. That kind of approach is seems to me to be pretty counter from where leadership is right now. Well, Karen, I was thinking if you, um, so you blend um, the word curriculum when you're talking about worksheets, for example. I mm -hmm. see that more like as practice, which is interesting because I was thinking um, from a curriculum point of view, we have our outcomes. We have our provincial outcomes in Canada in particular. and. And within that, we have our prescribed textbooks, just like you said. Or, or um, but I don't see that as curriculum. But on the other hand, we have a wide variety of resources that we can also use. But I don't know where that line is right now. Even as I'm thinking about it as a teacher, and and I think that's where the open learning opportunity will go as well, because there are some who are going to stick to prescribed, prescribed, and there's those who never <laughs> did. And I think is that what you're getting out of it too? And where is that line? I don't know. Okay. And it's not the same in higher ed because obviously the instructors, is that right, Christina? The instructors have to say over their curriculum and, you know, what they want to do. So it's not prescribed. Yeah, it depends on the, yeah. it depends on the course because in some programs there are, like in this course you will teach X, Y, and Z, right? And then in other programs you, you have very free range over what you want to teach. So. 
and then you choose the textbook so all the textbook sellers are coming to our doors every other day <laughs> trying to sell <laughs> textbooks yeah <laughs> yeah we don't get that so I, yeah. <laughs> I had a question in the chat um, I don't know if we're just done with this discussion or not but um, because on this on the slide you've got uh, these sort of you know other things that you came to with open including collaboration and sharing and connected learning and and I just came voice and agency just stuck out to me that those were the ones that I couldn't automatically like connect to openness and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that right well I would say um, in a in a really open learning environment where there is collaboration and sort of co-construction of knowledge, um, it, it calls out for agency because it's not prescribed. So it's more, you know, what, what do you need to learn? What's useful for you? And I, I would say um, it really relies on the learner to have an active role. And I think that's one of the challenges. It's certainly something that I've found in um, working with K-12 teachers, which is, the, I guess, I don't know what the primary work I do is anymore, but the primary work I do is, is with teachers. Um, and I sort of went through the shift myself in, in doing professional development for, with teachers. So 10 years ago, I was doing, I, feel, I always feel embarrassed to even say this, but um, I was doing just very, very traditional professional development workshops where, you know, there was a syllabus and the, this is what we're doing and I stood up and I was the expert who came into the district and I taught this stuff. And at some point, I just said, this is crazy. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if the teachers want to learn this. I mean, it was very much a district set agenda um, and not, not participatory on the part of the teachers. And so I really started looking at, you know, how how can I, or how can I be involved, or how can I not be involved? But how can there be a professional learning environment where the teachers are saying, you know, this is what, this is what I need to learn, and setting their own path? And really, where when it struck me really hard was when I was doing professional development about this sort of environment for students, and then I realized we're not mirroring this in, in teacher professional development. You know, we're saying to teachers individualize, customize, you know, co-create, be the guide on the side, whatever it is, and then we're, we're standing up and talking, you know, teaching this in professional development. Um, so that's certainly in a, in a, at an adult level, but the same thing as a student level. I think when you really move to an open sort of learning environment, it takes you in different places depending on what the learner's needs are. So that's that's the agency piece. And I think the voice goes hand in hand with that. But some of it is just, you know, what we were talking about before of really having the learner have a voice in um, what what's being learned and sort of how that knowledge is being constructed. And obviously that's far beyond just what OER is, but that's to me that's sort of what really open learning is. I think for me the best example was when um, I did my first MOOC that was only three days with high school students. And on the first day, they were all supposed to meet in Google Docs. And I had seven teachers um, for each group of three students. <laughs> we didn't have enough students, but we had lots of teachers. And we sat in Google Docs and stared at this blank page for hours and hours and hours. And we didn't know where the kids were or what they were doing. And finally, at the end of the day, they put in links or they summarized things. And they all did their learning in different ways, which was to create a blog together collaboratively. And, and the Etherpad ones were the most fascinating because you could track their whole progress and who was the leader and how they did it. And that, to me, was an example of what open learning is all about. It was they chose the tool. They chose how to learn. They told the teacher, this is how I learn. This is how I did it. And even though I clearly set standards and clearly told them which web tools to use, they didn't use them. They did what because I had, I guess, left it open enough for them to meet their own needs. And boy, did I ever learn. I think I was the one who learned the most. And the funniest thing was these teachers staring at an empty Google Doc, scared that these kids were learning, basically. 
and they proved us wrong. Anyway, yeah, I'll stop yeah. talking. That was just funny. That's great. It's I mean, it's great to see that when it actually works. I, I'm sort of playing off a theme in some MOOCs I've been in lately, which is talking about failures. I have been in situations where I've probably lots of situations where I've tried to facilitate something like that and it just didn't work. People just didn't seize the opportunity to do whatever. And it happened and, and sometimes I just think, well, I'm you know, some people are gifted facilitators at this and I'm not one of those people. And I've seen, you know, like Steve Hargan, I've seen Steve Hargan facilitate things with 250 people, and he, he gets it to be not a presentation, but an actual conversation. It's amazing. But, you know, sometimes I would do this with teachers that we all knew each other, everybody was comfortable, and it just didn't go anywhere. And I started pressing on, like, what, you know, what is the, what is the problem? And some of the teachers said to me, we've never been asked to do this. We don't know how to do this. We don't know how to set our own goals. You know, this isn't something that we've ever been asked to do. And I'm, I'm interested in ideas, either <laughs> similar stories or ideas about how do you jumpstart that with, you know, whether it's adults or, or, or youth, with people who just are not comfortable driving their own learning, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, I think kind of because I've failed at both taking open classes and also trying to run them. Um, and I find the ones that kind of work best, I, I kind of sneak into a pre-existing community. Um, but I think, Karen, when you talk about, well, the people that are all that are hesitant to do this already, um, I don't know the baby steps there. I think what I'm trying to do is figure out, you know, well, just try to figure out. But one thing we're going to try this summer, because we're kind of try to run our New Literacies Institute um, doing the first part. We're using a flipped model, and we're going to do the first part completely open. And then if people want to, you know, register for the face-to-face -face sessions, they can. Um, well, at least that's... I'm, that's the argument I'm making right now. Whether the funders allow me to do this, we'll see. Um, but making it so that, A, they don't have to go like some locked in place for their learning, um, but where they can just, uh, but have a place where they can kind of curate their learning depending on whatever network they do it in. So if it's, you know, if they did a Google Doc, they could just find somewhere where all they have to do is share the link. That's, I think that common that has to be a common thread. There has to be some kind of community hub, like the one you built, Karen. But I'm real. I want it to be a community hub that is network agnostic to where the actual learning happens. I just don't know if that's going to be possible, or if I won't have. You have to really have the numbers big enough to do it, though, because you could end up with two people on Twitter, one person on Pinterest, and you know. So that's my fear there, and that makes sense. I'm going to mute myself now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for for jumping in. And I I think that, that is a challenge, and and I struggle with the whole numbers issue. And I think particularly doing, you know, having been involved in some MOOCs that had external funding, you know, most with the I, I would say with the exception of one, mostly they're evaluated by the numbers. And I think, you know, I'm trying to, I don't know, have, coming out of a business background, that's my mode. Like, I, I get how you build things to numbers, and it's a goal, and, like, that's a really good model that I know how to step through. But I'm not sure that that works in learning. And, and I think, you know, one of my concerns about all the um, just fury about analytics is I think that you start incentivizing things that aren't, learning outcomes or they're not what you really want. And we've certainly seen it with with high stakes accountability in K-12 where, you know, maybe it, you could say everybody had the best of intentions, 
but you end up, no matter what, if it's high stakes, you end up focusing on achieving those numbers. And I think it's the same in professional learning or MOOCs or whatever. You, you know, you, yeah, Brenda said it's easy to count numbers. And, and, you know, you define numbers that you can count, and then pretty soon you're doing things that are crazy because they're not about learning, but they're about whatever that number goal is. And I worry about that in the online learning space. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's a personal tension, I feel, that I have to keep pulling myself away and saying, you know, it's not about the numbers. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm a little bit more bullish on analytics. Um, <laughs> Not so much on completion rates, not so much in this. And I was talking to um, Christina Cantrell about this is what if you looked at it, like analytics that give you deeper things about, um, you know, your engagement. So instead yeah. of just looking at how many times the thing was hit, what if you had the analytics of some of your users and you're looking at their bounce rate on their websites um, and suddenly they're all, they're building and they came in with a smaller audience at start, but they're building an audience that is starting to get more engaged. Um, or if you have, we're using all open tools, but with proprietary tools, you can kind of follow the learning paths that people take. And so you can know where are they dropping off in, what, what part of the, um, where, what part of the MOOCs are getting the most attention. And then you can kind of, feed the beast. So if that's the content your audience wants, you can, you know, push, develop more of that. Um, I do think that, yes, counting does limit things, but um, I, I think there there's so much rich data and we don't I know enough about analytics in the sense that this is where I think we could learn a little bit from what um, other folks in social media marketing or digital news kind of discovered. I think they're, I'm just, I'm a little bit more bullish, I guess, on, on analytics. Yeah, and I mean, but I guess I would push back engagement. on it. Not, yeah. Analytics for engagement, not 93% finished, 7% quit. I meant more like end user engagement analytics. Yeah, but even, I mean, thinking about the MOOCs, so, you know, typically there's some huge number of whatever it is, tens of thousands of people, and there's a small percentage of people that actually, that you can track that actually hit the stuff. Or, or that you know post comments. So we're always looking at how do you measure actual engagement. They actually post comments. They actually have a conversation. And invariably, in every one of these I've been in, at some point or th throughout, we hear these stories from people who the analytics show they're not there. And they're having these amazingly powerful learning experiences. I mean, I've had people tell me stories that like bring tears to my eyes. And I'm like, but you're not showing up on the analytics. And it's, you know, it's for a million reasons. They're not, you know, I think one of the, uh, another thing that struck me in what you were saying is th the systems that we use to track analytics typically are not open. And, and how that's playing out in the whole MOOC space, I think is, you know, it's interesting and sometimes troubling, but the 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 MOOCs that I would say people, some people are pushing back against um, are the more closed systems, and they're closed systems because you can see the analytics, right? People have to log in to see the content. I, I didn't mean analytics within the system. I meant so if I have my own blog and I create tags to go with the MOOC, uh -huh. are my, is my own writing in the open getting more attention? Not so, like sales. page views. I mean, what are you measuring? But more than more than page views, more than um, well, that that does work. But um, the the things like bounce rates, but completely outside of the closed MOOC. Just and I don't I don't think yeah. this could work. This is just me kind of like throwing around ideas in my own head, which is a very strange yeah. place to be in. Um, <laughs> but like, what if like so I'm doing something on I'm in some. Move, say it's on digital media making, so it's on you know movie making or something. Are am I getting views? Am I getting comments? Not from people inside the MOOC, but am I drawing in comments from people totally on the outside? Like am I am I building my own community? Um, and I think that can only happen in open environments, not so much in closed. Um, but I think you'll never get the numbers in an open environment that you get in Coursera. Percentage-wise, no, unless and, the, you know. unless it's, it's the onus is on the user 
to, to, to share their numbers. That, I want to add this, oh, sorry, the sustainability piece, because that learning that you're getting at, Karen, that deeper learning that we can all give examples of, how do you, there's, like, it's when I get a million emails from a student because I won't give them a mark, and they have to figure out what they have to do to meet my expectations or the expectations that they think that I'm imposing on them, which is totally not true, but that's what they believe. Like, how do you possibly get learning analytics to support deeper, more meaningful learning? And that, yeah. I guess, I'm, I'm in the far end, end degree, which is why when I see the 10% completion rates or of MOOCs, I'm like, yeah, but you completely, it's the 90% you forgot to ask, what did you get out of this? Like, why did you even take it in the first place? What, what was the most important thing that you learned? Why did you never finish it? And for K-12 too, and what you, actually your MOOCs are good at too is, like the Coursera's and this Australian one I was just in, I can't remember, they never give you the daily feedback. And you kind of lose sight that you need someone, and this is that human aspect again, you need someone to pull it all together. And that's where I think the role of the teacher is changing and the facilitator in open environments, especially when we're modeling how do you pull stuff, curate, bring it together, what's important, what what success stories happened today, you know, what who wrote a great post. And I remember, like, um, Downs used Grasshopper at the beginning. And I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. But something so simple just to track, you know, the posts, I think that had, we have to go back to that. Because every day I could see what people were doing. That was, what we, that was how we measured it. Although if you ask David Porter, he gets very upset if I use the word measure to, to talk about learning. <laughs> and that's what learning analytics are. They're measuring learning. Yeah. In well, and that's a very I'll connectivist be. approach that you're describing. And I think, you know, when we talk about open learning, we are talking about a connectivist environment. Many, many MOOCs that are out there, that's not their goal. You know, they're really looking at more of a, what they used to call individualized instruction, I mean, computer-based <laughs> training or something, you know. it's it, it is push the content. And I think, you know, there's probably some content or some skills that that's a fine way to learn it. I, I, I worry about the MOOC as a term. Just it, it's like open. It means so many different things. And, and also like open, as it's become popular, big companies co-opt the term. And you know, then it doesn't mean anything because there's so many different things. It, we've really seen it with open in the last year or two, where things that in in no concept of anybody in the open movement would call this open, companies are putting you know open as a big banner because now open is a popular thing. And I I, I don't know what to do. We I don't know what to do about that. We've had some conversations on Twitter about like. Do you really push back on that, or do you just say, you know what, I don't care. I'm going on with my life, and language is imprecise, and people are going to say what they're going to say. But it's, it makes it challenging, I think, for people who are new to the space. I, yeah, I wonder, I I'm looking at a good question, Michael. Uh, do we really need companies to, to, to make open? But um, I think there is a relationship because open has to be sustainable too. You cannot just yeah. give away everything. You go broke that way. There's, you know, you're not necessarily going to get rich, but uh, you have to plan for how is this going to sustain itself over at least the the short term. Yeah, you know, I think that if um, if the funding shifted, sustainability would take care of itself because there's more than enough money to have people other than companies doing all this. I, I think where the companies, I mean, I think the dream of OER is you don't need the companies, but the, the reality of K-12 curriculum purchasing or textbook purchasing or whatever you want to call it, instructional resources, um, the reality is it's it's an industry and 
it takes, you know, one of one of the, I'm on some committees of like how do you make OER like a bigger viable thing, and one of the things is you got to sell it to schools. There has to be people who go out to the schools and walk them through the purchase process and have professional development, and it has to look somewhat polished because there's just, there's an infrastructure in place in K-12 schools around textbook purchasing that OER is not going to crack it, unless there's some, I don't want to say some institutional involvement. I, I go back and forth on this a lot because I think my dream is that you get past that. But if you look at the reality of how states and schools purchase curriculum, it, it's it's a big, big money business. And you know, I think OER e either you get company partners and you get into that, or it stays a fringe thing. And I you know I think it deserves to be more than a fringe thing. But it's a really good question. So I see lots of other interesting things in the chat, including that we're running out of time and we haven't really talked much about actually K-12 OER. Thank you, Christina. So I'll just, I just want to do like a really fast tour through, for people who are interested, um, some places where you could find OER. And I posted some of these resources as well. Um, I, I do just want to clarify again that OER has a very specific meaning, and it means that the materials are specifically under an open license. So if if it's just materials that are on the internet and free, that does that's not open necessarily, unless it specifically says it's under an open license. And Creative Commons is the most um, prevalent one of those, but there are also people who've written their own custom open licenses. But basically, it needs to be marked somewhere that you may use, remix, and redistribute the materials, you know, cite the source and that's all you have to do basically. Um, the, the best OER for K-12 that I found, I've collected in a live binder. So I put this link up here and basically this live binder is organized by subject area and this is very specifically K-12. It's organized by subject area and then it's also organized by type of resource. So there's a tab for open textbooks, there's a tab for online courses and it's interesting that online learning is probably um, the, the space where OER is taken off most in K-12. And I think it's because, I think it's for a combination of reasons. One is that the big publishers didn't have as much of a foothold in that initially. But also it's just people who are more sort of on the leading edge anyway and looking for different resources and doing more individualized work and obviously already do, using digital resources. Which one of the things I was thinking about when I was reading the chat on the last conversation was to what extent is the digital piece of OER a barrier, and, and I think it is in some places. I mean, I've certainly, you know, there are equity issues. Now, OER doesn't have to be digital, and and like Utah has taken OER and printed actual old-fashioned print textbooks with it um, at, I think, 20% of the cost of regular textbooks. Um, so even if there's nothing better about them at all other than just that, 20% of the cost is pretty pretty big advantage. Um, but anyway, there's a um, there's different sections. There's a whole um, section on open professional development resources, which is something that I've gotten really interested in lately because, again, that's an area where schools spend many millions of dollars either flying experts in or, you know, buying programs where I think there's a lot of expertise out there that um, can be used free of cost and, and adapted. But anyway, that um, content.k12.openEd is, is a really good collection. And if people have specific questions about like where do I find OER in this certain subject area, um, drop me an email or we just started, um, I think either Greg or Verena nicely mentioned my new online community, um, which is specifically for K-12 OER and people who are who are just getting started in it and who are interested in connecting with other people. Um, and I think, you know, again, on the, on the bigger theme of open learning, that sort of making connections with other people who are doing this and collaborating on the work is where 
really meaningful things happen. So if you're interested in OER or you're looking for resources or you're doing some really specific physics unit and you're looking for something, um, either email me or post a question on there. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of us would be happy to sort of help people find resources that are useful. So I hope, Christina, that's a, a kind of a fast but um, wide-ranging overview of where actually K-12 OER is, and there's a lot out there. I mean, five years ago, I would say if a school came to me and said, we want to use OER as our main curriculum, you know, there were, there were pockets where it would work, like math came on really early, and there's a lot of good math stuff out there, especially um, middle school and high school. Um, but in the last few years, that it's really fleshed out, and there's, there is a lot of content out there that is high quality and free and remixable, and I, I think it's it's it really is viable now. And if you made some chart that said OER and Common Core, it would just I mean I could put Common Core in my shoe and sell it for the highest bidder. <laughs> so I could if you just took a made a you know some kind of oh you could do this standard with this OER, you could do this standard with this OER, then you get it. I mean, mm -hmm. but then you know that's its own dirty sales, but that's that's how you get into the school, a pretty it is. package and it uh, is. common core alignment. And, and I think like New York State particularly has really, um, when they were shifting, and, and other states as well, but I think they've done it in a way that's very visible. When they were shifting to common core, it, it's such a unique moment in time where everybody is about to spend this $5 million all over again on brand new textbooks because there are new standards. And they really um, seized on the opportunity of OER. They actually put out state bids and said, instead of buying these textbooks from commercial publishers, which we have to then rebuy every however many years, we're going to put the same amount of money into having publishers develop things that are open licensed so that then our teachers have the ability to refine, remix, improve on them. And we're spending the money once instead of spending the money over and over and over again. And I think they, you know, they, they have a lot of really great curriculum that is not only Common Core aligned, but actually written for the Common Core, which is pretty exciting. If you're not in Common Core or if you don't have anything to do with it, like all of Canada, that <laughs> and, and Alaska <laughs> but it's neat to see how things are put into standard in Texas and yeah and Indiana yeah and someone else yes. no I'm yes. Indiana yes. there's someone else there's yeah. another one yeah it's it it it, baff, it it goes towards the idea that you have to meet certain learning pathways if you have a common core or a set curriculum and I guess that's where I get confused and I mean there's enough curriculum out there so I guess a teacher that's needs to be a great professional. Summary. There is way enough out there. There's enough out there times 50 for what anybody in the world would need and there's every iteration of everything out there. Why do we keep, I mean why are these billion dollar publishers keep recreating the same thing? I mean, because they can, I guess. It's good business if you can get it. You take the same package and come out with a new version every year, you get all yeah. the profit without any of the overhead. Yeah. And now I, I do worry about... I wish there was on that. And they're, I think their digital projects, the subscription models that they're going to go to are actually, I think, going to cost schools more, not less. Yeah. Well, um, they've always maintained the printing isn't the cost. And that was a digital strategy, so they could charge the same amount of money. Well, now now that they'll rent, um, yeah. So I, I, I think so. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I was saying to Christina, I think one of the reasons that higher ed has made more inroads with OER is because students have driven it because they're the ones who bear the textbook cost. And there's actually an interested consumer that's shelling out $150 a book who can say, you know, if I can get this for free, why would I not do this? And it's not clear in K-12 who would drive that. You know, the schools get the money from the state, so I don't think the schools necessarily care. The states, you know, it's such a, it's such a system where there's this money allocated, and it's not like anybody's 
making a real purchase decision. No, where it's it, their it, money. The large urban districts have huge sway, um, and yeah. when they adopt things, they have a tendency to spread. Um, yeah. I wonder why the teacher unions haven't picked this up as an issue. Because to me, if you look at it as shifting money into teachers, it's usually written in the, it's usually written in the contract as not part of collective bargaining. It's but at a good. at a national level, yeah. I mean, there could be a le this could be a leadership issue where they could say, I don't know. It's but a I, it's I, a I really, it is the military industrial complex K twelve education. But the, the website you built does work, and I, I really like it. Um, Thank you. So. We're still refining it a lot. And if anybody goes on to it, um, we would love suggestions. We sort of started with what we thought were some basic questions. And, and I think one of the things that's different about it is we're, we're really trying to get to people. Like, a lot of people have heard of OER, but they don't really know how to get started. And those are the people we would love to get involved in this community. Because I think there are a lot of people, like probably all of us in this room, <laughs> who, who are really steeped in this. And you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of sites you can go to and read a stimulating debate on the nuances of every Creative Commons license. But like, I'm like, I don't care. I'm more interested in like an actual teacher in a classroom who wants to use this and does, you know, needs help getting started. That's what's interesting to me. And I think license debates and you know metadata and that stuff is not the things that are going to make this get critical mass. Although Greg's right, because if you can use APIs to um, protect protect your student content, meaning the personal information, then you don't have to use an LMS anymore. And then if you can get out of using an LMS then you can actually work in the open and have opportunities to do things you've never been able to do before, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm interested in, you know, we've talked about this sort of all the student data, SEPA and FERPA and every other thing. And, and I'm interested in whether you all think that that is really a substantive issue that's preventing this from happening, or if it's, and I would say this is not just about open stuff, but any technology. Is it just the yeah, 93rd clearly. technical excuse that people are risk averse and they just don't really want to do it? It's an easy thing to say we can't do it because of this. No, and I, I know we're going to avoid barriers, and we now we're ending on barriers. But yes, it, okay. is, it is in the forefront of the minds of the school administrators. Um, they, they are worried about student data. Um, if you look at all of the... Um, what's going on with just the, the, the teacher evaluations in the states where, where teachers are uploading student data to Bloomboard and, and these private parents are going crazy that their, their kids' data is out there. Well, their kids' um, data is out there everywhere, and I don't see the pushback with commercial publishers on that. And that's why I wonder, no. is it just an easy excuse? I think well, people, I'll just go out there and say, I think people who really want to do this, you can do it, and the legal stuff is not an obstacle if you really want to do it. Like, oh, they're wrong. It is just a fear, and you're right. I'm all yeah. for you. I'm with you. Just go do it. But so I think but, I think where that takes me is you have people have to feel a compelling reason to do it, or they're always going to come up with fear-based reasons they can't do it. So let's not worry about the fear-based stuff. Let's just say, is there a compelling reason to do it? If there isn't, let's not do it at all. I don't know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. well, I have to call it a night, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming on with us. Oh, yeah. Sorry I was late. The kids took forever to go bed to bed tonight. Thanks for coming, Greg. Yeah, thanks for coming. And we are, uh, it's 7 o'clock. Um, I'm happy to stay a little longer if anybody has other things they would like to talk about. But if anybody has to go, certainly we can... Uh, I'll call it a night. I don't know about Karen and Verena. <laughs> I'll just, you know, maybe sort of closing, but I'll just say with regard to all of the possible institutional barriers for this, including SEPA and FERPA and all that stuff, as well as textbook purchasing and all that, I would say that you can do a lot with open resources and open learning in your own classroom. 
sort of without worrying about those barriers. You know, I, I most of the teachers that I work with, that you know, they have a set of textbooks on the shelf somewhere because that's how the system works. It doesn't mean you have to use them. You know, it, you 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 don't have to have a closed environment. You know, there are a lot of subversive ways to make learning better for students that don't, that, you know, that skirt those things. And I've never it's seen anybody get in any kind of trouble for doing that. Even I haven't gotten too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, what about research, though? I just want to ask you about that because I've been researching what we need to research on. I can't find any peer-reviewed research. Um, this, like the ISTE stuff, but really.